Order. I call the Secretary of State, Gavin Williamson, to make a statement. Gavin Williamson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with permission, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to make a statement regarding testing and examinations in schools and colleges next year. The pandemic continues to cause disruption throughout our education communities, and I'd like once again to pay tribute to the enormous efforts that all our teachers, school leaders and support staff are making to keep young people of all ages learning. I would also like to pay tribute to the Global Teacher of the Year Award winner, which recognises the most outstanding teacher from around the, from around the world. Our very own Dr Jamie Frost, maths lead at Tiffin School in Kingston-upon-Thames, has been shortlisted for this after his tuition website went virt viral during lockdown, helping millions of pupils in the United Kingdom and around the world to continue their studies at home. He has already won the Covid Hero Award, and I'm sure the whole house joins me in wishing him luck with the overall prize. Mr Speaker, we are not going to let COVID damage the life chances of an entire year of students by cancelling next year's exams. Exams are the best form of assessment we have, and we are therefore taking steps to make sure that any student preparing to sit them in 2021 has every chance possible to do their very, very best. We support Ofqual's decision that in awarding next year's GCSEs, AS and A-levels, grading will be as generous and will be, uh, maintain a similar profile to those grades awarded this year. This is to recognise the exceptional circumstances that students and teachers continue to work under and to make sure that students are not at a disadvantage compared to previous years. Ofqual is also working with the exam boards to make sure students studying for vocational and technical qualifications and other general qualifications benefit from the same generous approach. I know that students and teachers are making enormous efforts to catch up with any lost learning. To support those most affected by the continuing disruption, at the end of January, students are going to be given advance notice of some of the topic areas that will be assessed in their GCSEs and A-levels. This means they are able to focus on these areas in more depth and target their revision accordingly. Students will also be given exam aids, such as formula sheets in recognition of the time lost in the classroom, and to give them more confidence and reduce the amount of information they need to memorise in preparation for exams. All these measures have been drawn up with the most affected in mind, and we'll be sharing the advance notice about what exactly the measures will entail with schools and colleges at the end of January. Students taking vocational and technical qualifications or other general qualifications can also expect a number of concessions, including a reduced number of units to be assessed. We want as many students as possible to be able to sit their exams, and for this reason we have a contingency package to make sure they can do so, including spacing exams more widely, as well as enabling vulnerable students to sit exams at home if they need to. In the minority of cases where students cannot sit all their papers, or for the very small number of pupils who miss all of them, there will be means by which they can still be awarded a grade, including additional papers available after the main exam series. Mr Speaker, the fundamental problem with this year's exams is that we try to award grades without actually holding exams. We are not going to be repeating that same mistake again. With the me measures I have outlined, we are confident that every student who is preparing to sit exams this summer will be awarded a qualification. As the virus continues to be a fact of life for all of us, schools and colleges are making impressive efforts to ensure education can continue for those students who must remain at home. We've reviewed and updated the guidance for remote education so that schools, parents and pupils all know exactly what to expect from it. 
primary schools need to provide an absolute bare minimum of three hours a day on average of remote education and secondary schools an absolute minimum of at least four. Schools will also be expected to check and provide feedback on pupils' work at least weekly, as well as informing parents immediately where engagement is a concern. The Department will also ask schools to set out details of their remote provision on their websites, so that parents can better understand their school's remote education offer. As levels of COVID infection continue to fluctuate, we know that different areas will experience varying levels of disruption to learning. We will therefore commission an expert group to assess any local variations and the impact the virus is having on students' education. I would now like to move on to the measures we are taking in respect of the school and college accountability framework for 2021. We need to make sure the arrangements for inspection and performance measures are fair and reflect the current public health situation. They need to take into account the enormous challenges that schools and colleges have been facing, but equally we must continue to provide the information and reassurance that parents need about their children's education. We will not be publishing the normal performance tables based on test, exam and assessment data next year. Instead, my department will publish data on the subjects students have taken, how well schools and colleges support their students in their, to their next destination, and attendance data, taking account of the impact of COVID-19. We'll also publish national and regional data on 2021 exams, tests and assessments. We'll make the exam data, importantly, available to Ofsted and to schools themselves but we won't be publishing it on performance tables. Mr Speaker, I'd now like to let the House know how our plans for school uh, and college, colleges are affected by inspections. It is our intention that Ofsted's routine graded inspections will remain suspended for the spring term, but will resume in a carefully considered way from the summer term. In the meantime, Ofsted will carry out monitoring inspections in schools and colleges most in need of support. This will include those that are currently judged inadequate and uh, some that are in the requires improvement category. Inspectors will be focusing on areas that are particularly relevant at this time, such as curriculum delivery, remote education, and importantly, attendance. There will also be a focus on those pupils who are particularly vulnerable. But I'd like to stress that they will not be making graded judgments and that any inspection activity will be sensitive to the additional pressures that schools are working under at this current time. As in the autumn, Ofsted will also be able to inspect a school in response to any significant concerns about safeguarding, but also about the delivery of remote education by that school. In both the early years sector and the independent school sector, the intention is also that standard inspections will remain suspended for the spring, with assurance inspections in the early years and non-routine inspections in independent schools taking place in the meantime. I trust this provides the House with reassurance that we are providing the right balance in our accountability and inspection arrangements. Mr Speaker, I'd like to finish today by outlining our proposal for the curriculum and testing in primary schools to recognise the particular challenges that they are facing. Assessments in primary schools next summer will focus on phonics, mathematics and English reading and writing. This means that for 2021 only we will remove all tests at Key Stage 1 the English Grammar, Punctuation and Spelling Tests at Key Stage 2 and Science Teacher Assessments at both Key Stages. The introduction of a multiplica uh, multiplication uh, table check will be postponed for a further year, but schools can use it if they want to and it's a 
resource available to all schools, and we'd encourage them to do so if they can. We'll also add more flexibility to the timetable. So if there is any disruption due to coronavirus in a school, pupils will be able to take the test when they return to the school. These measures will help us to address lost learning time and will give us a chance to support pupils and schools who need help. It will also provide vital information for parents and better help to pupils to make a su successful step into the next stage of education, going to secondary school. Mr Speaker, everyone in all of our schools and colleges is working as hard as they can to make sure that no pupil loses out because of COVID and that the future they are dreaming of is still very much within their reach. I'm determined that the coronavirus is not going to jeopardise the life chances of this year's pupils and I'm confident that this plan is the fairest way of doing this and I commend this statement to the House. We now come to the Shadow Secretary of State, Kate Quinn. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Secretary of State for his statement, for an advanced copy of it, and may I also thank the Schools Minister uh, for briefing my honourable friend, the member for Ilford North and me yesterday. May I also join the Secretary of State in congratulating Dr Frost and wishing him well for the finals of the Global Teacher of the Year Awards. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I am glad that the Government have finally responded to the pleas of students, their parents and teachers who have been asking for months how next summer's exams will be conducted fairly. But while I welcome measures to help pupils be assessed on what they have learned, that reserve papers will be in place for pupils who might miss out, that performance tables will be suspended and that routine Ofsted inspections will not resume in January, many of them measures that Labour called for, today's announcement still bakes in fundamental inequities between students who have suffered dis different levels of disruption to their learning. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, the Government has known since September that an ongoing pandemic would create huge challenges in schools, and for months they will have heard school leaders, parents and members on this side of the House calling for a credible plan to address them. It has taken until December to provide one. So can the Secretary of State tell us what took him so long? Why did he leave students in a horrible and uncertain limbo? The truth is that the delay has limited the department's options. Had they acted sooner, they could have done more to make the system fairer. Yeah. I do welcome the decision to make the distribution of grades similar to last year's, to ensure that people sitting their exams this year don't feel unfairly disadvantaged. But we know that last year, while grades rose across the board, some pupils, particularly those in private schools, were more likely to see a sharp rise. Yeah. So how is he going to ensure this year that the distribution of grades is spread evenly across schools and postcodes to ensure that the most disadvantaged pupils are treated fairly? Yeah. And is he not concerned that providing information in advance about subject content will at best benefit pupils at random, with those who happen to have already covered the assessed material benefiting at the expense of those who did not? And at worst, will it not in fact mean that pupils who face the greatest disruption to their learning lose the most? There was significant support for greater optionality in exams. Indeed, his department has taken exactly this approach for some exams already. It allows pupils to be assessed on what they have learned, with fewer pupils losing out at random. If it works for some subjects, can the Secretary of State explain clearly why it is not part of today's announcement? Yeah, yeah. What steps is he taking to address the fact that over a million pupils were out of school this week? He talked about regional disparity, and we know that exam classes in some regions have faced disproportionate levels of disruption. Can he tell us when the expert group will report, why it has been established so late, I understand just last week, and will it include representatives of school leaders and teachers? On remote learning, I notice requirements, but how many laptops have been delivered to students who need them? Yeah. Why are we continuing to hear reports of schools receiving laptops only after students isolate, wasting valuable time getting them set up and delivered? Yeah. And why has the National Tutoring Programme now been stretched more thinly across two years? Can he even guarantee that all students on free school meals will have access to tutoring? Yeah. We know that many students sitting exams next summer want to go on to university or college. 
What discussions is he having with colleges and universities to ensure any additional support these students may need will be in place for them next September? And does he believe any changes will be needed to the timing of university admissions? Can he tell us when pupils taking vocational and technical qualifications will receive further clarity? And what steps is he taking to clear the logjam on the testing of apprentices' functional skills in maths and English? Does he acknowledge that there are more likely to be more appeals than in a normal year? How will he ensure all students can access a fair appeals process? And will he ensure that there are the markers with the time and resources needed to grade papers and time, particularly in the second exam window? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I want students to have the chance to show what they've achieved in the most challenging of circumstances. But after months of silence, these proposals fall short of the fair exams the Secretary of State promised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, at best, Mr Speaker, a requires improvement. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you ever so much, Mr Speaker, and I'm glad that the Honourable uh, Member could uh, bring herself to welcome the measures uh, uh, slightly grudgingly at the start. And it's uh, no thanks to the party opposite. There's actually schools are back and children are in schools. There's no thanks to the party opposite that we were getting over 1.6 million children back into school. People. Is, it, is it possible to face me a little bit as well? Secretary of State. I know that, Mr Speaker, you always love the Secretaries of State to look adoringly at you, and I'll take that, uh, I, I will take that as uh, dutifully rebuked. But the party officers have never championed pupils because they haven't fought to get students back into schools. And it was actually the Mayor of Greater Manchester that wanted to send children out of school and back home. But this party stands for getting children back into school. The Honourable Lady highlights a number of issues and, um, you know, it is disappointing that Labour haven't engaged in a positive debate. They couldn't even be bothered to respond to the off-call qualification about exams. Uh, they seem to have missed the opportunity, Mr Speaker. Maybe it got lost in the post or maybe, quite simply, they just couldn't be bothered. Um, we do recognise there are significant challenges in terms of uh, delivering education at this time, and that is why we've taken a package of truly unprecedented measures in order to assist schools, in order to assist uh, teachers, but most importantly, to assist pupils themselves. And I'm sure that the Honourable Lady would grudgingly acknowledge that all academic studies have continuously highlighted that children from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, children from black and ethnic minority communities, are the ones who always outperform predicted grades when they sit exams. And that is why it is so important, and it's good to see that we have a common uh, view on this, and I note the chuntering from the Honourable Gentleman sat in the Chief Whipseat, um, that there is a, um, a common view on the importance of exams. And the measures that we've taken, by giving people advance notice, um, we do recognise children will have missed out elements of the curriculum. But giving children that advance notice, it gives them the opportunity, along with their teachers, to use that time to focus in on those areas of curriculum that they know they're going to be tested on. We're also recognising the importance on technical and vocational qualifications, and we'll be looking at making sure that that information is shared at a uh, similar time as to when we're sharing it on GCSEs and A levels. And the Honourable uh, Member highlights some important issues in terms of uh, uh, potential for extra appeals, making sure that's properly extra resourced. That's certainly what we will also uh, be doing as well. Um, we uh, recognise there are challenges by giving extra learning time and the fact that we have moved exams or most exams back by three weeks. This will put added pressure on the exam boards and we're working closely with the exam boards to support them in terms of being able to get the right resources in place and be able to deliver the grades when and as we would expect at the end of August. Let's head to the chair of the select committee, Robert Halford. Robert Halford.
Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I think it's right that we have exams in some form next year because at least it gives pupils much needed structure. And I thank the Secretary of State because there is no easy or perfect option. But I have two questions that I would like to raise with my right honourable friends. First, are we possibly baking grade inflation into the system as we saw in 2020? Could we not ensure that grade boundaries are in line with 2019 results, or at least between 2019 and 2020 results, so we can revert to the standards of 2019 whilst no one loses out and start transitioning back to normality? From a social justice position, does inflating all the grades just move the goalposts in that the difference between disadvantaged pupils and their better off peers remains the same? And second, we know from the DfE's own data that 798,000 pupils in state funded schools were not in school for COVID-19 related reasons on Thursday 26th of November. Is there a way we could track every single child to assess the learning he or she is getting from the school so that and that Ofsted will be given a much stronger role to ensure children are learning and that we use the £143 million allocated to the catch-up programme to make sure every pupil is prepared for this year's exams rather than rolling over that money, that funding into next year. Thursday. Uh, well, thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you to my uh, right honourable friend. Uh, we have commissioned an EPI study looking at the individual learning loss, and we're getting data uh, into the department on that, and we will be uh, asking the expert group to look at that and as to how best to assist and address. Um, um, I, I think um, I, I do take my right honourable friend's point about uh, he would have probably preferred a, a more of a middle ground between the, uh, the grading between 2019 and 2020. I, I, I firmly believe that for those children who have uh, um, had to deal with so much in terms of a pandemic and as they prepare for their exams, it's really important that their, their grading as they sit their exams and they get their grades is, um, is equally as um, you know, reflective of that work, but does recognise uh, the fact that they've been through uh, a tremendous amount this year. And I think that it would have been unjust for them to have sets of grades having sat exams that were um, substantially lower than the grades that were received in 2020. Let's head up to Birmingham with Jack Dromey. Jack Dromey. Changed. Looks a lot younger. <laughs> I, th I, I don't think we've arrived in Birmingham at that stage, so we'll now head to North Thanet with Sir Roger Gale. Sir Roger. Whatever my right honourable friend does in connection with exams is likely to be considered to be wrong by some people. And I congratulate him on coming in up with what is probably the least worst of the options available to him. Um, you'll remember that a couple of weeks ago at uh, Education Questions, I raised the issue of SATs. It's a particular concern, obviously, to primary schools this year. He touched upon the testing regimes for primary school children and indeed for secondary school children. I wonder if he could expand on that and indicate precisely what he expects of teaching staff and whether he believes that perhaps for this year only assessment might be the way forward. So State. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my um, uh, right, uh, right honourable friend. He, he is right that there is not an easy pathway. And I think my, uh, my opposite number equally recognises that any route that is taken is, uh, uh, does present quite uh, significant challenges in terms of delivering assessments and examinations. Uh, but we, I do believe this is uh, the fairest and most robust way of doing it. In terms of SATs, we have uh, removed these from uh, performance tables, and I think that's an important measure. But SATs do present a really important way of measuring the attainment and the position of where a child is. And this will be really vital for schools as they make that assessment and support that child in terms of catching up on lost learning. We do hope that by removing it from the performance table, it removes a lot of pressure from teachers that teachers sometimes do feel and help in terms of delivery of SATs. Let's head to St Albans with Daisy Cooper. Daisy Cooper. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, securing fairness for all students will be absolutely key. So whilst I welcome some of the measures that have been announced today that go in the right direction, I'm worried that the creation of an expert group is simply kicking the fairness can down the road. So given the huge variations in learning between individuals, schools and local education authorities, when specifically will that expert group be reporting on their proposals and when will the House be able to scrutinise them? Uh, well, the reason that we put in place a whole set of measures, whether that is extra learning time, whether that's a change to assessments, whether that's the advance notice, whether that is to give exam aids, these are all there to support children who have suffered from lost learning. And the expert group will report to me uh, in the spring uh, as it makes a proper and thorough assessment of some of the challenges that students have faced. Learn sex. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This year, students such as those at Petrock College in North Devon have faced unprecedented disruption to their studies as a result of the pandemic. And for those who are due to sit some of the most important exams of their lives so far, this disruption has been perhaps felt most acutely. Can my right honourable friend assure me that the measures his department is, are taking will ensure these students are treated as fairly as possible in both academic and vocational subjects? Yeah, yeah. Well, I would like to assure my honourable friend that the measures we're taking, they are truly exceptional. They're not measures that we'd have ever expected to take in any normal year. But the only reason that we're taking them is to support students in her constituency to ensure that they achieve the very best grade that they possibly can do and make sure they unlock their future life chances. Jim Shannon. Mr Speaker, and I thank the Secretary of State for his, for his uh, statement as well. But can, can the Secretary of State outline steps taken to ensure that the devolved administrations whose pupils carry out English board exams have all of the relevant information to enable schools to clearly lay out the pathway to exam attainment? And will this message be going to parents and children soon to ensure less stress for these young ones who have more uncertainty on their shoulders than children have had for many, many generations? I think my honourable friend highlights an important point. The measures that we're taking is to very much uh, reduce stress and pressure on students. And of course, many students in Northern Ireland sit uh, papers from English exam boards. The measures that we're taking uh, will obviously be replicated in Northern Ireland for those uh, pupils taking English exam board papers. Uh, just yesterday, I was speaking with uh, Peter Weir, uh, the Education Minister for Northern Ireland, and at every stage we are considering uh, implications uh, that may uh, arise uh, as a result of these cha changes for Northern Irish students and we are doing everything we can do to accommodate any concerns that uh, uh, Peter Weir may have uh, on behalf of pupils in Northern Ireland and we hope that we can balance that off. Going over to Bob Blackman. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I warmly welcome my right honourable friend's statement uh, this morning, which will end the uncertainty that I'm sure is experienced right across the country. Will he join me in thanking and congratulating the hard work of teachers and students across Harrow who have been desperately trying to catch up with the learning that they've missed? And will he use the opportunity now of, of a revision to the process to ensure that exams are not just a test of knowledge, but far more a test of how you apply that knowledge in assessing how students have performed across their period of time in school. Well, we will always look at different options to improve our examination system and, uh, uh, and how we work with exam boards. And I'd be more than happy uh, to meet with my honourable friend to discuss that in greater detail. In terms of catch-up, and I would like to pay tribute not just to the teachers and support staff in uh, Harrow, but right across uh, the country, who've done so much and actually been assisted by the billion back billion pound COVID catch-up fund to actually give extra resources so extra teaching can take place at weekends and in evenings so children have the opportunity to catch up on work that they've lost. McCarthy. There's been some research um, from the Education Policy Institute, amongst others, that suggests that the performance of pupils with special educational needs and disabilities can be particularly vulnerable to being underestimated in assessments. And given that some of these pupils may also, for health reasons and shielding, have had more disruption to their education, how can we be confident 
that any new system introduced for next year will take their needs into account. Um. Well, I, I think the Honourable Lady raises a really important point where there's a lot of shared concern on both sides of the House. Um, w this was one of the reasons that we particularly weighted the COVID catch-up fund to deliver extra money for those schools who uh, are there supporting uh, children with special educational needs, because we do recognise there's uh, some uh, acute and difficult challenges. And uh, I'd certainly, uh, I know that my uh, right honourable friend, the Minister for School Standards, would be happy to sit down with her along with uh, uh, the Children's Minister uh, to discuss um, any extra support or interventions she thinks that would be of use and benefit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I congratulate my right honourable friend for achieving a compromise that enables students in the Aylesbury constituency to sit exams that they've long worked towards, they actually want to take, but ensures they also have the best possible chance of receiving a fair result. Can he assure me that this strategy will be able to withstand any future shocks that may arise due to COVID-19, so that teachers and pupils in Buckinghamshire can therefore now plan the next two terms with certainty? Well, this is why we've uh, taken the decision to announce this uh, at this stage. And uh, uh, for the four nations in the United Kingdom, I think, believe this is the most comprehensive and detailed plan uh, for uh, how we're going to proceed with assessment and examinations and awarding of grades. And I hope this gives every school leader, every teacher, but most importantly children, uh, a clear sense of what they're going to be assessed against so that they can achieve the very best grade that they're, uh, they, they sort of uh, are capable of doing. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, in his remarks, the Secretary of State quite rightly said he want to, wants to boost fairness and support students, but he'll uh, be aware that just last week there were a million uh, students who were not able to be in school and in one school in my constituency, Warwick and Leamington, 63% only were in school. A massive disparity. Um, on the 21st of October, the Secretary of State said that he would deliver 500,000 laptops. We only have 200,000 so far that have been delivered. Uh, uh, does he accept that there is a, a massive gap there to deliver on that fairness he promises? And does he also think that there is a, now the, 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 the priority to be given to teachers to be vaccinated to ensure they can stay in school? Um, I, um, I very much share the Honourable Gentleman's view about the important role that teachers and also support staff have been playing in delivery of education. And obviously uh, there has... Uh, right through this pandemic, uh, a national priority of putting uh, education at the centre of the government's response. Uh, that is why schools have remained open even during a national lockdown. Um, there will be specific clinical needs that have to be met as part of a vaccination programme, but there has always been a priority put on education and the ability for teachers to be able to get into school and be able to teach and the support staff who are able to support them and will obviously be looking at this in the next wave and announcement in terms of vaccinations. David George. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I congratulate my right honourable friend on the position regarding exams today as someone who was keen to see them go ahead, but more importantly, all the young people I've spoken to want to yeah. see them go ahead as well so that they're in control of their own futures. Does he agree with me that given the learning loss, particularly for the disadvantaged young people, it will still be important for schools to have an effective system for young people to learn during the holiday periods yeah, between yeah. now and the summer to give these exams their best shot? Um, uh, I, I think my honourable friend raises a really important point and a great opportunity for many schools to take advantage of. Uh, I know so many schools have been putting on extra lessons after the school day has concluded and so many schools have been looking at how they can use the holidays, Mr Speaker, in order to be able to deliver extra education catch-up for those critical uh, year 11s and year 13 pupils. And it's a great idea and certainly something very much encouraged. They said up to Greater Manchester with Andrew Gwynn. Andrew Gwynn.
Thank you. I welcome this announcement, but let's talk about regional disparities because I share the concerns of my honourable friend, the member for Warwick and Leamington. More than 12% of children in Greater Manchester were impacted by COVID-19, meaning they could not attend school. That compares to 5% nationally. IT poverty affects up to 18% of the student population and good learning conditions at home affects many more. So how will this announcement help mitigate the impact on the these pupils, how do we make it fair for them? Stoke. Well, as I touched on in an earlier answer, that uh, uh, obviously we expect schools to deliver a full curriculum, but there will be some schools who have been impacted that means that they will not be able to deliver every aspect of the curriculum. But by giving a uh, advance notice of the topic areas, it means that those schools and those students are able to focus on those areas that need to be covered for the exam over the coming months uh, in the run-up to exams. Let's head up to Lincolnshire with Dr Caroline Johnson. Dr Caroline Johnson. Hello. Hello. I welcome the um, Secretary of State's uh, statement today because I know he's considered very carefully how to make it, uh, things fair and the students and staff will, will welcome the certainty. Um, the students and teachers in Sleaford and North Highcombe are working really hard to catch up with any lost learning, but it is clear that some students and through no fault of their own, will have missed more days off school than others. Um, can my right honourable friend tell me how the £1 billion catch-up fund will be targeted towards those students who need it the most? Secretary State. Well, it's not, um, it's not only the, the general part in terms of a catch-up fund, but also the specific national tutoring programme in terms of targeting children from most disadvantaged backgrounds. But we've always believed that schools, with a knowledge, the intimate knowledge of their own pupils and understanding of their learning needs, are the best ones to be able to target how that money is spent so that they are best able to catch up. Sarah Robin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have heard from teachers, school leaders and young people across Luton North, all saying that we need alternatives to standard exams next year. Students from Luton Sixth Form and the Luton Youth Council wrote to me with a comprehensive list of options um, last month, and I urge him to hear their concerns. And the head teacher of the fantastic Leelands High School summed it up perfectly when he wrote to me sharing concerns for not just children's future, but also their mental health. It has become apparent that the disparity in experience of Year 11 students across the country is vast, and those who are suffering the most have no control over us. There are many ways to assess what young people know, understand and can do. Yeah. Will the Secretary of State listen to teachers, parents and students and avoid any unnecessary fairness of exams, or does he just think he knows better? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have spent a great deal of time working with stakeholders, uh, listening to children, uh, listening to teachers and uh, professional academics as to how best we do this. And that is why we have pulled together the proposal that we have done, putting the interests of children very much at the heart of everything that we do. Jonathan Gullis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I congratulate my right honourable friend and his entire departmental team for today's statement, because it gives certainty and clarity to teachers, pupils and parents for exams in the summer. We know that schools, including those in Stoke on Trent North, Kidsgrove and Talk, have been hit hard financially this year due to COVID-19, which will only be added to by needing to advertise, train and hire additional exam invigilators, a challenge in the best of times. So will my right honourable friend back my call for an army of volunteers made up of former and retired teachers, and please add my name to that, to help the national effort and deliver exams next summer? Well, I'd be absolutely delighted to add my honourable friend's name to that list of arm that army of volunteers that will go out there and helping schools. But we don't just need invigilators, we also need markers, those people who have experienced as teachers who are maybe retired, making sure that they come forward and assist us in this significant effort to make sure that uh, the papers are marked punctually on time. And it's a great opportunity to give something back to a next generation and to schools in your community, either volunteering as an invigilator or coming forward as a marker. I believe Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Yet another statement from the Secretary of State that doesn't mention children in care or children with SEND. 
It's not surprising since just last week the Court of Appeal found he's acted unlawfully in scrapping critical safeguards from these very same children. Will he now take the opportunity to apologise and outline what support he is providing to them so that they are as exam ready as every other child? Yeah. Well, we have a very proud history uh, that actually we put the needs of the most vulnerable at the heart of our response, whether it was the COVID catch up funding, making sure extra funding is going to those children children who most need it, or whether it is the fact that in this country that we took the lead, a global lead, of making sure that schools and colleges remained open for those children with special needs and those children who are most vulnerable. We led the world in that and we are very proud that we took that lead. To Great Grimsby with Leah Nietzsche. Leah Nietzsche. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that keeping schools open as a national priority has been vital for our young people, especially for those in my constituency of Great Grimsby, to ensure that their disruption to their education has been kept to a minimum as much as possible. Um, however, we can't deny that despite the best efforts, many young people have had their teaching and learning disrupted more than others. Therefore, can he ensure me uh, that the, um, the measures that will now uh, be taken will allow those students to catch up on their curriculum and make sure they achieve their best that they can in their exams? Well, my honourable friend is absolutely spot on when she says highlights the importance of getting schools open, keeping them open and making sure as many pupils attend as possible, because it is the best place for children as the chief medical officers for both England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland all highlighted. Children are always better off in school. So we're so pleased to see so all schools open, uh, schools open and so many children back. Uh, but she is right to highlight the need for children to be able to catch up, but also to be able to focus their attention and their efforts on the key areas that are going to make a real difference in terms of their grades in exams. That's why we've taken these unprecedented and uh, significant measures to ensure that children in her constituency are able to get the best grade um, and be able to achieve their absolute maximum potential. Yes, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In Manchester, some Year 11 pupils are now in their fifth period of isolation. Most have lost at least 10% of class time because of isolation, and many of those pupils don't have digital, decent digital access to enable their home learning. Now, the, the deputy head at my local high school told me this morning, the system he's putting in place will serve to widen the disadvantage gap. He, he repeats that exams are the fairest means of assessment, and all studies point to that, However, those studies were not undertaken in the, under a global pandemic. Can I plead with the Secretary of State to think again about what more he can do to help those pupils who have been disproportionately affected by uh, isolation? And that doesn't need to include keeping all examinations, because on exams, making the playing field slightly smaller for everybody isn't creating a level playing field for those disadvantaged pupils. Stay. Uh, the measures that we've introduced are designed very much to support the pupils he talks about. And I know from my own personal experience with my own daughter facing her uh, GCHC exams in this academic year and had to isolate the impact and, you know, that it has on all children. That's why we've put these measures forward to assist all children. And uh, that's, uh, that's what we've done and we believe it will make a significant difference to all children in his constituency and in my constituency. Let's head to Combe Valley with Jason McCartney. Jason McCartney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I appreciate there are no easy solutions here, and I've been discussing these difficult issues with the principals of my local sixth form colleges, New College and Greenhead College. My area in West Yorkshire has had some of the highest COVID rates in the country, with hundreds of students off with COVID or self-isolating at any one time. How will the Secretary of State make it fair for students in my patch then who have been disproportionately impacted by COVID and level up their life chances? 
Well, this is how, what all the measures that we are introducing are aimed at doing, making sure that children who have been in a situation where they have missed out on the opportunity to learn uh, are able to focus their efforts as they come to that crucial exam period to be able to focus on the things that are going to matter most to them in terms of achieving the very, very best grade. This is on top of the action in terms of the COVID catch-up fund that has already uh, been um, uh, initiated and is available to all students in his constituency. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I met last week with head teachers from across Gateshead who talked about this very issue of unfairness. So today's uh, statement covers the issue across the whole cohort. But as many other colleagues have said, has, what measures will he be taking to ensure that those who have been through isolation? And there are many of those in the North East and in my constituency and don't have access to technology are really able to make up that difference and to be able to be tested fairly in that system. Well, again, uh, Mr Speaker, not wishing to repeat myself, this is why we recognise that there are children in that situation. That's why we think it's really important that teachers and pupils alike have a clear sense of where the testing is going to be applied. So over the final months, as they head to uh, exams in summer 2021, they're able to focus that effort and those resources in making sure they cover all those key critical areas. Speaker, and I warmly welcome my right honourable friend's statement. Uh, the excellent teaching staff across Coshelton and Wallington are doing their best to prepare for the 2021 exams, but they've been telling me that um, when students have to self-isolate, obviously there is disruption. So can my right honourable friend assure me that he will put education at the top of, uh, top of the priority list for vaccinations as they begin to roll out so that we can return to some form of normal teaching before next year's exams? Uh, my, my honourable friend uh, makes an important point, uh, and in terms of vaccination rollouts, we've also been doing uh, testing pilots around the country as to how we can be in the best possible position for if a child has COVID that there isn't a large group of children that are then in the position of having to self-isolate. And as we uh, complete those pilots, we will look at uh, how we can roll that out, especially into the areas that have been most affected. Uh, the honourable, my honourable friend makes an important point on vaccination. It's certainly something we're looking at how we can prioritise that as teachers and support staff play such an important role in our national endeavour. Let's go to Greater Manchester with Rebecca Long Bailey. Rebecca Long Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Secretary's statement sadly does little to address the disadvantage that pupils, particularly from northern schools, have faced compared to other areas less affected by the virus. Alarmingly, a survey of NEU members found that nearly 80% felt they would not be able in the time available and with repeated pupil absence to teach the whole syllabus. So at the very least, will the secretary accept that to give pupils a real chance, he must release those topics which will be on exam papers now and not wait until the end of January? It's um, um, very nice to see the Honourable uh, Lady again. And uh, uh, the reason that we are putting uh, this focus and the advance notice for schools is so that they are able to be in a position where they have missed time to focus on the areas that matter. Uh, I appreciate that the Honourable Lady would want everything uh, uh, yesterday as against in January, uh, but the work will take a little bit of time for exam boards to be able to pull together, but it will be done swiftly, it will be done by the end of January, uh, to give schools as much space as possible in order to focus their attention on these areas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The stress and anxiety that has been faced by so many pupils, staff and parents uh, due to COVID restrictions cannot uh, be denied. So I very much welcome my right honourable friend's statement today. It is the right thing to do. And can my right honourable friend give me an assurance that his department will also do everything possible to ensure that the message goes out loud and clear to anyone that might seek to stigmatise the class of 2021 as having had some sort of easy pass rather than these measures being rightly about fairness in the face of exceptional circumstances. 
My honourable friends, is absolutely spot on. The children who are facing exams this year have done so much, and in quite extraordinary circumstances, and the grades that they will receive will be a real testament to their hard work, their dedication and their commitment to education, either up to the 11 years in the run-up to their GCSEs or the 13 years in the run-up to their A-levels and other vocational qualifications. And uh, uh, I hope employers in the future will really recognise the amazing work that's gone into every single grade and every single achievement of all our children. Dr Rupert Hook. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Around 80% of Ealing schools have had COVID cases, leaving gaps in learning and holes in budgets. Some of them demolished walls to accommodate distancing, and now they've got huge staff absence bills, uh, all at London prices. So can he compensate all of those in full and prioritise not just teaching staff, but the admin lot, who've worked non-stop throughout all this, because the Chancellor seemed to have given them all an effective pay cut last week. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, we already set out uh, details to support schools uh, during this COVID pandemic, uh, not just in the run-up to summer, but also uh, during uh, this current term as well. David Simmons. Mr Speaker, it, it's always easy to criticise, but does my right honourable friend agree that, while sadly it appears that the dog ate Labour's homework on this one, the statement which he's standing in does provide head teachers in my constituency and others with certainty? And does he also share my admiration for the work that's been done by local authority virtual schools to ensure that children who are in the care system are able to access the wide range of support provided by the government to ensure that they continue to close the gap? with their peers who are not in care. Um, my honourable friend highlights a really important area in terms of a, of a virtual school heads programme that has been uh, with local authorities and schools, you know, been a real success where you've seen a real impact to those children, uh, some of the most vulnerable children in society, with some of the very best attendance uh, for those children by getting that tailored support. It is a scheme that I would deeply love to see uh, rolled out more extensively because the evidence points to the real impact and the real difference it's making to young people's lives. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State referred to remote provision in his statement, and yet last half term, school laptop allocations were cut by 80%. This decision affects the most disadvantaged pupils greatest. So will you reconsider the decision and commit to delivering the laptop provision that schools were originally promised? Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Well, Mr Speaker, we continue to deliver ever more laptops every single week. Uh, over a half a million laptops will be going out, and we continue to do everything we can do uh, to support schools uh, with laptop provision. So, Christopher Chill. Mr Speaker, will my right honourable friend congratulate St Joseph's School in Christchurch on being given a, an accolade by the Sunday Times of being one of the best primary schools in the country? And can he tell us on what basis and what criteria are going to be available to the public to enable them to judge primary schools next year if there are no tests at key stage one and very few at key stage two, bearing in mind that the key stage one tests are a test against which future progress is also gaged? Well, I'd very much like to join my honourable friend in congratulating St Joseph's School in Christchurch for such an accolade. And I'm sure uh, both he, those teachers, uh, parents and, most importantly, pupils feel incredibly proud at receiving it. Um, we do recognise that we've had to uh, make some changes which we would not normally want to do in order to be able to uh, facilitate the smooth functioning of schools, but there we are going to continue to publish data on schools, uh, including attendance, um, so that uh, parents are in the best possible position to make the best choice for their children in school. Very much. Mr Speaker, some regions of our country, including my Slough constituency, have been especially hard hit by the pandemic and Slough schools have faced several outbreaks and huge disruption as a result. And there is also the, the huge issue 
of the digital divide experienced by many of our more disadvantaged and less well-off communities. So, in addition to the Secretary of State's announcement today on exam changes, surely he should consider regionally targeted measures to support those areas which have lost out the most. Uh, we believe, Mr Speaker, this is a comprehensive package. We are going to be asking the expert group to look at some of the challenges that uh, uh, you know, students will face in order to be able to progress on to their next stages, and we'll look at the evidence that's provided very closely in relation to lost learning. Let's head to Worthing with Tim Lawton. Tim Lawton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the decision to retain exams, not as the best, but as the least worst form of assessment? And having held a uh, virtual roundtable with heads recently, I know they'll welcome this long-awaited uh, clarity and the flexibility that's going to be given to schools who've been in areas of high COVID uh, uh, infection, which have, has obviously impacted on classroom time. But can I ask him about A-levels and university applications? Because unfortunately, other nations in the UK rushed ahead to scrap exams for next year. So therefore, Pupils from England applying to Scottish universities, as my son did, or to Welsh or to Northern Irish, uh, will be treated differently from those pupils in those uh, other nations or those uh, pupils coming to English uh, universities. How can we make sure uh, that all are going to be treated equitably in this uh, divergent system now? Well, we've been working very closely with UCAS and Universities UK on this issue. Of course, uh, universities have been used to different systems, uh, and there have been, a, uh, you know, the Scottish system in terms of its, uh, you know, both its grading, its curriculum, and also its uh, uh, the, the the qualification at the end of it has been very different to the English system, and there has been divergence between Scotland. Uh, Wales, Northern Ireland and England uh, over the past few years. We are confident that the universities, by giving this clarity at this stage, including the clarity on the, uh, the way we are going to be grading and the generosity in terms of grading, they will best be able to adapt. And uh, We saw a record number of students going to university last year, and we won't be surprised to see a record number going to university next year as well. Let's head up to Manchester with Lucy Powell. Lucy Powell. Thank you uh, very much, Mr Speaker. I still don't get how these proposals mitigate for extended absence of teaching and learning. It's not just about the differential in lost schooling, which still isn't resolved, but the differential impact that missing school has on some children. Those unable to access learning, unable to cope, unable to engage and to thrive. The loss of six months and counting has massively widened the gap. Simply making the grades more generous for everyone equally doesn't deal with the widening and widened gap. So isn't it the case that the Secretary of State's dogmatic fixation with exams has blinkered him to solutions that would more effectively deal with the growing and widening gap and the impact of school absence. Uh, all the measures that we have undertaken have been aimed at supporting those children who have been most affected. But we have to understand that every child in this country has been affected as a result of this pandemic, and that is why we also have to have a, a national approach to support all children. But we have created a system that supports those children who have uh, suffered uh, the most and making sure that they're in the best position to focus their studies, their time on the areas that are going to deliver them the best results in terms of grading in August. I said to Bickley with Sir David Evner. Sir David. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I welcome my right honourable friend's announcement of a package of measures to ensure fairness in next summer's exams, despite the many challenges. Can he assure me that if the disruption caused by the pandemic continues into next year, the situation will be monitored and assessed, and if necessary, further measures could be introduced? Well, we are 
absolutely certain that we can deliver a full exam series. Quite simply because over the last number of weeks we've delivered a full exam series for GCSEs and A-levels where students have been, tens of thousands of students have taken those exams and they've gone safely and have been successful. So we're absolutely confident about being able to deliver that exam series in the summer of next year. But my Right Honourable Friend highlights the issue of uh, uh, loss learning, differential learning, and this is why we've set up the expert group to be able to advise as if there's any other interventions that we need to take to ensure students are in the best possible position to be able to progress to college, to university, uh, into an apprenticeship or the world of work. Let's head up to Hull with Carl Turner. Carl Turner. As you know, Mr Speaker, East Hull has been one of the hardest hit areas by the pandemic and our schools have faced massive di disruption. So I want to thank my school leaders, teachers and support staff for performing what has been near miracles in keeping schools going. But the support from the government has been derisory up to now. So what regionally targeted measures Will the Secretary of State be implementing to make sure those areas like mine are not left behind? Well, at every stage, we're wanting to support all those schools that have been impacted by the pandemic, whether they're in uh, East Hall or East London, whether in the east of England or the southwest, the northeast. Uh, or the North West and will continue to deliver that support not only to schools but most importantly to children. Sarah Brittle. Mr Speaker, I've been on many calls with my local schools and Mr Speaker, as someone who represents a seat in Lancashire, your schools will be facing the same difficulties that mine are. Due to our infection rate, it has meant that local pupils have had to isolate more than once and their education has been severely disrupted. So can my right honourable friend reassure me that if the disruption caused by the pandemic continues into next year, it will be monitored and assessed and that if needs be, further measures could be introduced? Well, this is why, Mr Speaker, we established the expert group to look at some of the challenges and the ongoing challenges, as it isn't always able to predict as to the course that this pandemic will able to take. Obviously, there is a great deal of optimism uh, and excitement about the future and the rollout of the vaccine, but we do need to deal with, uh, continue to monitor uh, the challenges that we face as a result of this pandemic. And if extra measures need to be added, uh, we would certainly not be blinkered uh, uh, or ignore such other measures that were needed. We now have the final question from Polly Lynch. Thank you ever so much, Mr Speaker. I did ask head teachers in my constituency for suggested questions to the Secretary of State. I did have to rule at least one out on the basis that it would have been unparliamentary, Mr <laughs> Speaker. But I do just want to stress again on behalf of all head teachers that the disparities in the disruption to schools are significant in areas like mine where we've had higher than average infections and restrictions for much longer than other places, particularly impacting on our communities with higher proportions of black, Asian and minority ethnic pupils. How will the Secretary of State ensure that his proposals today reflect those really serious differences? Well, the reason that we've got the uh, package of proposals together as we have is to deal and support with schools in the Honourable Ladies constituency, such as Halifax and many other areas right across the country. We recognise that there have to be exceptional measures put in place to support them. That's why we've taken the steps we have. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safe arrival of those participating in the next and suspend the House for three minutes, order.